Hi, this is Mike Edelhart. I'm here with another edition of Inception, our podcast about beginnings, the beginnings of companies, new ideas in science, uh, uh, new approaches in AI, and sometimes even a little glimpse of the future. And uh, today, I think we're going to get a bit of all of that. I'm here with Tal Brown from Zone 7, who is one of our uh, newest and certainly at least in my view, most unique and uh, forward-looking uh, portfolio companies. Great to have a chance to talk. Thank you, Mike. It's an absolute pleasure to be on board. So probably best to start out by just uh, having you explain to everybody what Zone 7 uh, is, what it does. We've seen a lot of AIs. We look at a lot of companies. We look at a lot of companies with AI in one form or another as a component of what they do, but we have never seen an AI like your AI. So, <laughs> uh, so explain to everybody what Zone 7 is and what it does. Well, I kind of like the cliche of being the founder with the coolest AI in the portfolio. <laughs> um, so Zone 7 is built around this problem. Um, human beings are pushed sometimes beyond their physical limits. Um, this happens in work environments, about physical exertion. It could happen in work environments around just working long hours. Um, and it also happens when we as individuals are trying to accomplish some kind of fitness goal. Um, and nowhere else is this more dramatic than in sports where we're pushing individuals to way beyond their limits. And, and when, they, when this happens, we see devastating results, uh, devastating in terms of well-being, st- well-being events like beginning injured or burning out but also devastating for the organization, Uh, not just because there's medical costs associated, but because the organization is losing productivity from some of the best performers. And that is in a sense what Zone 7 does. So we address that problem, not by uh, creating new watches or wearables or um, sensors, but we act as an intelligence layer that will analyze all the information available from the environment this can cover well-being data, medical records, operational data about what happens when these people work and how productive they are. And then we create risk profiles using machine learning and also recommendations. So it's basically like a daily playbook for you how to perfectly tune your workload and recovery and effort to stay at your peak condition. And sport was our first industry because it's the only industry, or at least it was at the time, with unlimited data about human performance. Right. Right. So they have a lot of data about the players on the team because professional sports teams track everything and everybody does everything all the time. So you have a lot of activity going on and then you have these regular peak activities, which we would call basketball games or football games or soccer matches. And um, so in, in a real world sense, so there I am at Liverpool or a, uh, an NBA team and zone seven, who am I? Am I the coach? Am I the strength coach? Am I, uh, uh, you know, sort of the performance guru? And then what is it zone seven gives to me that, and is it given something to me or is it giving it directly to the players uh, through me? Just how does all that kind of work? Sure. So, so teams, sports teams have a collection of individuals looking at the well being of players and the performance of players. Um, it's a combination of medically trained folks, doctors or physios or athletic trainers. Um, it's a combination. It's also people from the coaching side. So it could be the coach himself or strength and conditioning and also data people or sports science people looking at this. Um, sometimes you call this the MDT, the multidisciplinary team. So these people are in charge of making these decisions every day. Who's ready to go 100%? Who can go 120%? Who, who needs to go 60 or 75%? Who needs, a, who's, who needs rest? And those decisions are today done by collecting a lot of data, usually storing it in some kind of like unified database or a spreadsheet, depending on the organization. And then kind of like creating some charts and alerts on it. Usually a little bit simple on the on the kind of like scale of things that we were used to doing with machine learning. So, you know, we look at the data, we set up some charts, we look at some uh, alerts on those charts, some formulas, and we try to make a decision. When you do that for 20 or 30 or 50, athletes every day, six days a week or seven days a week, you know, 180 or even 250 days a year, that's a lot of work. And so what zone seven is, is an 
uh, algorithm that runs in the cloud that has analyzed data from your environment as a client, but also from a hundred other environments, and is using all that data to calibrate risk levels and to calibrate these recommendations. So it's not, it's a tool, it's like a compass at the hands of the practitioners, at the hands of the MDT. It helps them align on some objective quantification of risk and also to look at some intervention options. Sometimes you have to reduce your effort levels because you're doing too much running or too much uh, weightlifting. And sometimes you actually have to push it up a little bit because you're not doing enough. And that's exactly where the software becomes extremely helpful to, to uncover some of those blind spots in the analysis process that it, you know, when it relies just on the human side of it. Uh, it's really fascinating because uh, so many of the AIs are sort of looking back and saying, here's how you got here. And to some degree, a uh, significant degree, your system is looking forward and saying, here's what you can do today to essentially create a better tomorrow. Yes, yes. I think what we do is unique um, in the kind of AI space for two reasons. One is exactly what you say. It's not just retrospective analytics. It is prospective suggestions. We actually, um, we, we don't just say what we think the issue is. We actually make recommendations on how to mitigate that risk or how to deal with things in right. the future. And that is exactly, you know, we're used to that when we're driving, right? Google Maps or Waze will tell us what the optimal route would be to drive somewhere. It's looking into the future. So we kind of like using that metaphor, we, we kind of do the same. It's kind of like a navigation system looking into the next couple of days, suggesting what the athlete or the coach should be doing uh, to, to look at different risk options. The other thing that makes us unique is that a lot of AI and machine learning startups are connected in real time into the system they're trying to, to, they're trying to affect. So I've got machine learning that can determine ad prices on Google, or I've got machine learning that can control cybersecurity intervention um, uh, issues. For us, there is a human operator we are trying to help a human operator see unblind some blind spots. So we need to deal with humans. Humans consume this, not other algorithms. Mm -hmm. And so that makes a lot of our product about managing that gap between the expert human operator uh, who wants to make really good decisions every single day and providing them with a tool that helps them uh, make those decisions faster and more accurately. So we actually interact with humans, not just other algorithms. That's a really interesting point. So facing that there's a expert, but human, which means illogical, quixotic, sometimes gets tired, misses things, uh, 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 prone to mythology and all that at the end of your system, what does that mean in terms of what you have to do and how do you have to deal with that? Is it hints? Do you say things three times? Uh, uh, what's the nature of how you can be effective taking a machine learning system and helping humans be more effective yeah. in the future. The human operator in the kind of sports environment is very, very busy. They need to uh, uh, combine in their head the player thing the and also the coaching demands for the game. So they need to build trust in the system, right? You trust the compass because it's always going to point north and you can test it at any time of the day. It's always going to point north. So we aspire to create a system that fosters trust. And you do that by being as accurate as you can, but you also do that by recognizing that even the system will have blind spots and you need to be open about them. So overselling the accuracy or uh, hiding from, obfuscating from users areas where you're kind of uncertain, that's actually a mistake in these scenarios. Um, you want users to be aware that this kind of red flag is a little bit less confident whether the other red flag is really, it really is. And finding ways to communicate that over time has been, has been I think, something that we did. Uh, we, we did well. We learned from a lot of mistakes and, and implemented a lot of changes that foster trust. It's all about trust. You don't have to be 100% accurate, but you need to be able to communicate to folks that, you know, you are a trusted tool. Um, and the ultimate, ultimately, you see that in engagement. If somebody onboards to the app and then you know, drops off after a few weeks, that's a sign that the trust has been missed. But if you're seeing people come back to this every single day for months and months and months, season after season, then you kind of, as an AI system, as a machine learning predictive algorithm, you figure, you know, you realize that's a good sign in terms of the trust you were able to build. 
So the good news is you have something that's really never been done before. The bad news is you have something that's never really been done before. So, <laughs> you know, you show up, you can't say it's just like an Oreo, except that it has peanut butter in it. So uh, you have that challenge that startups sometimes have that you essentially have to create the market into yes. which you sell the product and, and all that. So if you would talk about that a little bit, how do you do that? I mean, you're basically you know, laying the track in front of the locomotive as the train goes uh, roaring ahead. Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. And it's, it's, it's perfect for this kind of uh, conversation because um, it's, it's something that in the investor founder conversation comes up as, so how, how big is the budget line you're trying to tap into? And, you know, some startups in certain areas, you know, cybersecurity or whatever. Oh, you know, the, the guy I'm going to sell to has a budget line with my name on it. And it has a gazillion dollars allocation every single day, every single year. That's not the case for me because we are operating with teams. We're organizations that have a tech. They have a tech kind of like department in a way, but they're not used to licensing machine learning algorithms in the cloud. They're used to licensing to buying medical sensors or wearables or paying salaries to folks looking at data. So, you know, we have a budget kind of zip code, but we don't have a budget line. And part of what we do is to, I don't say educate the market to evangelize that. Yeah, this thing, this problem that you guys are trying to solve, which is really important people in the organization being down with injuries or whatever, that problem now has a new kind of solution. And it may not be in your budget line, but it's certainly effective. So. So a lot of what we do is evangelize that. And for us being in a science medical community, that evangelism has to be accompanied by bulletproof uh, case studies, almost as good as a published uh, journal article. Not exactly, but so, so we have to navigate that super, super validated bulletproof science proof plus evangelism. And then we basically make progress. So yeah, we chose, we chose a challenging path, um, but it is rewarding. You know, when you see clients, win a championship with 50% less injuries or 50% less uh, player miss days missed than they did the year before. Um, and, and these clients step on the podium and say to media, to ESPN, to whoever, this is partly because of our work with Zone 7, then it's extremely rewarding. And then that creates a ripple effect throughout your, uh, your, your client base. So uh, uh, two last questions for me. One, so we're talking a lot about sports here and, and not being specific, and I'm not sure how much you can talk about who the customers are at this point, but they're great, big, well-known people listening to this and looking at it would recognize these organizations and the folks affected by this. Now, they're about as cutthroat a bunch as you can imagine. So if, you know, if, if you're helping the Warriors, the Lakers are, are going to try and kneecap you. So how do you uh, deal with the... Uh, uh, this works probably best if everybody does it, if the data is universal, if the experience lifts the uh, 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 baseline for the entire sport or the entire league. So uh, what, if anything, you're doing about that at this point? So I think, I think we're not there yet. I think there's, there's very, very few, my, my, my assessment is, especially in soccer, where we've been most active, very few teams have been able, be able to elevate above with their homegrown solutions around machine learning and in, in, in this space of performance and injuries. So we are, the, 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 the boats that are working with us are certainly lifting above the tide. And as we grow, I think we are lifting more and more boats up upwards. Um, I think this becomes a must have, you know, if you're not, if you're, if you're running a sports franchise, and this is true today already, if you're running a sports franchise and you don't have a serious bunch of people looking at data seriously, you're not going to be able to outperform or overpunch your weight. So, you know, the money ball revolution is happened 10 years ago. Everybody's more or less in a certain already that it's lifted everybody up upwards. I think for us that that's going to happen. And it's also going to open up a lot more possibility because the more data you have, the more cool things you can find in the data, um, partly about injury risk, partly about optimizing for performance specifically around games and, and uh, fitness. And, and we're seeing that already, you know, more and more teams are giving us more and more kinds of data. Like we're getting data from watches mm -hmm. and rings, stuff that three years ago wasn't even on the map. Sports is where you are, but is sports where you will be? I mean, at least from our point of view, 
you know, we weren't investing in a sports AI. We were investing in an AI that can assess risk in the future that starting in sports, because it makes a lot of sense to start in sports, but could yes. go all kinds of places. Yeah, yeah. so you might, you're right. Um, we don't call ourselves a sport tech company. We call ourselves a human performance or human AI company. Um, the principles that we apply in the sports side, which is quantifying your physical workload, quantifying what, how your body responds to that, quantifying the kind of operational results you can produce, and then creating, and then also medic, analyzing your medical record to figure out when you got hurt. Those principles are now applied to other environments where humans are pushed too hard. Uh, we're now deploying a project in New York with a big hospital um, around the well-being of surgeons uh, or residents. They are not physically hurt by doing surgery, but they are pushed to their limit. They're working six days a week, 60, 70, 80 hours a day, and burnout is a huge issue there. So can we, we are now detecting breadcrumbs leading to burnout in a totally different environment, but based on the same principles, which include wearables and right. medical records and all that. So for us, the future is about, um, uh, you know, I, I would like to say dominating uh, this space in pro sports, but also taking this to a lot of other industries where individuals are under pressure to perform physically and are being pushed too hard. You know, this happens on oil rigs and on trucks and on hospitals and hospitals and, you know, and manufacturing plants. So for us, anywhere where humans are under severe conditions to overperform at work, we can be helpful. Um, and a great example is Amazon. They just they just announced a huge initiative to cut down on injuries in their their facilities. So this is not going to go unnoticed, uh, hopefully by, you know, the Fortune 500 bunch of companies. Mm -hmm. Understood. Early days, but extraordinary stuff. We could go on and on and on, but I think we're going to have to wrap uh, for now. Uh, excited uh, to have a chance to work alongside you. Can't wait to see what happens uh, uh, next and uh, best of luck to you and the team uh, both here and back in Israel. Thanks, Mike. My pleasure. Thank you also for your faith in us uh, as a team and in our vision. Um, and it's phenomenal to have um, this kind of support from you uh, throughout the journey. So thank you. For, I, I look forward to many more successes together. Here, here.